So I started, uh, this first slide is of um, a question that I've been asking everybody, no matter their position, formal or informal, or where they live in the world. It's, can we actively make a choice of an identity of who we want to be for this world, for this time? So I'd like to ask all of you, how do you name yourself right now? Those of you who are at the, in the different parts of Schumacher, what are some names you use to refer to yourself? Besides your given name, I mean like activist or such. I'd like to hear some of them. Storyteller. Storyteller. Educator. Educator. Mother. Mother. Padawan. 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 What language are we speaking? Jedi. Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. Apprentice. Apprentice. Wizard. Wizard. Religious. Religious. We have a nun here, so yes. Witch. Witch. Uh -huh. Social God. entrepreneur. Social entrepreneur. Warrior. Warrior. Animal. Animal. Wow, you are an interesting group. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So I'm more used to people naming themselves as social entrepreneurs, activists, change agents. Uh, but I like wizard and witch especially. <laughs> So I want to talk to those of us who have chosen a path that is outside the norm, which most of you have done, OK? Um, because there's some characteristics of this path. I am going to talk about perseverance on, on, in our work. But there's some characteristics of stepping out from the norm and being countercultural and being thinking of oneself as either a subversive or a revolutionary or just aren't willing to take it anymore kind of person in this world, all of which I deeply value. So I'm going to start with a series of quotes that I think are quite inspiring from different sources. So this is from Raina Maria Rilke. This is a beautiful quote, right? Again and again, some people in the crowd wake up. They have no ground in the crowd. They emerge according to broader laws. They carry strange customs with them and demand room for bold gestures. The future speaks ruthlessly through them. Do you identify with the, the, the really deep expression of this quote, right? If only it were that simple. <laughs> If only we could demand room for bold gestures and not meet with any opposition. So this is a sort of romantic quote for me. The second one is from Thomas Merton, the great Christian mystic. And I use this as the foreword to my book, Perseverance. I stand among you as one who offers a small message of hope. There are always people who dare to seek on the margin of society who are not dependent on social acceptance, not dependent on social routine, and prefer a kind of free-floating existence under a state of risk. How's that sit with you? Yeah? Have you discovered in your own life how to not be dependent on <clears throat> social acceptance or social routine and really feel it's OK if people criticize you, and it's OK if people ridicule you, and it's OK if people don't understand your motivation or malign you. Have you been in those places? It's very common when you're walking on the edge. One of my favorite quotes about creat creativity by Salman Rushdie, he said that creative people go to the edge. They go to the margin of their society or culture, and then they look outward. You know, they're not looking back. They're looking outward to the future. But this is a state of risk. I could, I could just spend the night with the quotes I've collected. I'm only showing you three. But they all have this sensitivity that, yes, there's a lot of freedom in this. 
bold gestures. You know, you feel really good about it. But it's a state of risk. And so <laughs> Rudolf Barrow, the great German activist, said this, which is kind of like a theme for me. When an old culture is dying, the new culture is born from a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. So let's notice that he said a few people. It's never masses of people. In fact, the research now shows that revolutions are created by 2 to 5% of the people. And it's not the poorest of the poor. It's really the sort of lower middle class people who create revolutions. I'm not saying that's what we're going to do tonight. <laughs> but I keep hoping for it. <laughs> So here we have the first uh, sort of a foundation here is that when we go into the world wanting to be different, not for our own ego satisfaction, but because we feel that's the way we can, we can support and facilitate change, right? Not the old roles. I don't know about the wizards and the witches, but a social entrepreneurs, activists, change agents, people who just don't like and really feel great sorrow for what's happening in the world. So we want to make a difference, right? Is there anyone here who doesn't want to make a difference? Some sort? I don't, I don't, I don't know many of those people, but most of them live in my country, America, I can tell you that. <laughs> We want our, our work and our lives and our families to be meaningful, right? And to usually to be meaningful not just to us. I mean, we're not just in, in it for ourselves. We're in it because we want to extend our compassion and generosity and energy to other people. Is that who you are? Because if not, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> I mean, we're done. <laughs> OK. So we've already identified that this is a very risky position, that we have to be willing to be insecure. And there will never be masses of us. For a long time, people have said, well, you're just preaching to the choir. Yes, that's exactly what needs to happen. A small group of dedicated people, as Margaret Mead said, are the only way the world changes. So I only want to be speaking to the choir because I want us to sing our song with more confidence, more clarity, and really know that we're all in this together. So that's the first piece, though. It's risky work. It's filled with insecurity. But the other piece of it that's very compelling to me is when you look at the history of activists, they describe that there is no known path that they are working from. It's not like they have great insight and know exactly where to lead us. I'm going to show you three quotes again from three different traditions. So the first is Martin Luther King, who's very famous for this phrase, we make a way out of no way. So we're working with the unknown. We're working with uncertainty. There's no clear map or guidance. And then Antonio Machado, who wrote during the Spanish Revolution, this is, you may have heard part of this quote. It's very famous. Wanderer, your footsteps are the road, and nothing more. Wanderer, there is no road. The road is made by walking. There's a folk song with that line. By walking, one makes the road, and upon glancing behind, one sees the path that never will be trod again. Wanderer, there is no road, only wakes upon the sea. What's left by the boat passing, right? <coughs> this is scary, I think. I mean, this is really, uh, uh, you know, we, we misuse the phrase trust walk, but that's what this is that we're in this together. We're already dealing with being different. We may be dealing with insecurity and uncertainty. And then our leaders tell us this. We make the path by walking. And then it disappears. So the leader of the, in Chiapas, Comandante Marcos, a wonderful poet. I mean, his writings are really worth reading for the Zapatistas. He said this, 
You thought I knew where the road was and you followed me. But uh, no, I didn't know where the road was. We had to make the road together. And that is what we did together. That's how we got where we wanted to be. We made the road, it wasn't there. What stands out to you in this particular passage? We did it together. Anything else? You can't see the road and then it disappears again. You make it by walking and then it's gone. It's gone. So that also means there's no way back from where we came. Yes. So I want to focus on the together of this, that we are walking an unknown path to an unknown future in a state of risk. Wow. What a job description, right? <laughs> I'll have to remember that one. <laughs> so that's why I want to talk about this topic, perseverance. This is the cover of my small book. It's a carry with you book. Um, and I want to explain the cover. Uh, this was done by New Orleans. Dante Salam, who, like everyone else, now it's almost 10 years since Katrina. There are a lot of celebrations and learning events planned, and I will be at some of them. Asante was part of the diaspora. People just got broken apart. Their families went in all directions, rich and poor. It was quite horrific for them because they were such close-knit communities, five generations living on a street. So Asante, who had been trained as, an, as a multimedia artist, went to San Diego. And she said one day her healing began. And she was sitting at the window. There was a very soft canyon wind blowing. And she picked up what was there and started to create this work of art. She used what was there. So if you look carefully, you can see these creases. She used a cardboard box, just the inside of a cardboard box. And then she found real flower petals to crown this woman with. And everything that's white is just tissue paper torn and pasted on, layered by layer, and then a pencil and this beautiful woman came into form. For me, it's a powerful image of perseverance because we work with what we have. We don't wait for somebody to give us what we think we need. We just work in the moment with what we have. But this whole topic of perseverance is especially important to me because I've seen enough of the journey of those of us who are committed to our activism, to, for our lives to be meaningful in terms of what we might create for other people. So what I've observed, this is one of my grandsons, by the way. <laughs> he was only 11 months old there. But that our work begins from passion, right? We're, we're encouraged to find what we're passionate about, what really brings us alive is one of the current phrases, or what, where's the juice? I don't know what metaphors you use. Those are very common ones in my circles. So our work begins with passion. And I just want to say that passion is a good place to start, but it doesn't carry you very far. Because we make the road by walking, we're under a state of risk, and we are bound to be disappointed. <laughs> OK? <laughs> <laughs> so the work of perseverance became very important to me as I saw so many of my activist friends, young and old, being, being uh, depressed, de-enervated, um, withdrawing because of the number of setbacks and disappointments they encountered. So passion is what, where we start, but it's insufficient fuel for the length and difficulty of the journey. It's clear in the Chinese character for perseverance. 
because this character has two components. It's a knife that is suspended over a heart. What a powerful image, right? Of course, it would have 10,000 meanings, being a Chinese character. Uh, I met a, a Korean Zen woman nun whose teacher had given her this as her lifetime exploration. What does this mean? So with all humility, I would only say that her present day experience of this was it meant that as I do my work, the path with heart, my heart is opened. It's cut open by my experiences, and therefore more compassion becomes available. That's a very beautiful interpretation. A more common one that I found is that we're under a state of risk. You know, If your gesture is a little too bold, <laughs> there's a knife right there that may just slice you in the form of whatever, criticism, job loss, slander, et cetera. So putting all this together, that, that we choose to be different, we choose to stand out, we choose to see the future first, we try and embody that in our work, which means we are taking on a risk-intensive work with no clear path. That's even a better job description, I think, right? And there's a knife over our head. And there's a knife over our heart. So the question I've been in is, can we be people who persevere? What does it take to persevere? These statues from uh, the pre-Cycladic era are 3,500 years old of women. I think they're beautiful. The first thing to remember is we're nothing special that we all come from lineages of people who have persevered. We stand on enormously fit shoulders. None of us would be here without our ancestors who struggled, who went to war, who migrated, who dealt with poverty and disease, and none of us would be here. So as one of my teachers said, he said, you know, it's just our turn. <laughs> you know. No big deal. It's just our turn to be those people who are willing to keep going. So perseverance, of course, doesn't mean that you keep beating your head against the wall or, you, or that we behave like Sisyphus and keep pushing the rock up the hill. I mean, my impression of Sisyphus is after the rock rolled down the second time, I think it would have been better to analyze the situation more fully. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's talk about this. Of course, he had, was cursed by the gods, but still, a lot of us behave that way. If something's not working, we just do it faster or we do it longer. And, and we we take all the blame on ourselves for it not working rather than noticing maybe we're working with gravity. Maybe we're working with a bad situation. So for me, perseverance is not just keeping on no matter what. It really is the ability to notice when the conditions are against us and also to withdraw. Um, we don't need to be martyrs. There are enough of those around. We do need to be people who can persevere, which means being able to stay. And stay means sometimes disappearing for a while or just withdrawing. So here's what people who persevere face. This is a Maori woman. Look at that list. And I, I gave up. I mean, I could have gone on and on and on. I just didn't have enough space. Because there's so many negative experiences for people who are committed to staying and to being of service. Fear, aggression, failure, criticism, broken relationships, exhaustion, despair. Do you see any of those and recognize them as things that have occurred in you? Yeah. So because this is the path, this is to be, this is predictable. This we know we will encounter. When we're trying to do good work, we will be criticized for it. When we're trying to do good work, 
we will become exhausted. We will become despairing at times when we watch it all fall away. We can be prepared for these and not take them personally. That's the thing. These are not personal dynamics that only you get <laughs> hit with. They're in the field of what happens with people who are trying to do things that are good and that are done differently than the existing paradigm. It is to be expected. So to not take it personally is a core skill. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But these are to be expected. You cannot avoid them. So what I wanted to do this evening was focus our attention that when we're making a way out of no way, we need to pay attention to several things. But this is my list for tonight. To pay attention to our relationships, to pay attention to how we're dealing with the strong emotions of this time, and how we deal with our personal well-being. Not for selfish reasons, but because we want to stay. We want to stay in the midst of the mess. And all of these things go under the phrase, you know, we made the road together. So how do we stay together? So the first topic, of course, is relationships. And this is my image for how current culture is working, that it works as a giant centrifuge extractor. Now, centrifuge extractors take solutions where everything is working harmoniously and spin them at such a speed that they separate. I think it's a very good metaphor for this time, because we're going so fast. We're so overwhelmed with tasks and work and issues at home and career issues and all of it um, that we really have less and less time to be in the kind of casual conversations or important conversations. Or, you know, I notice in, in my own work, this is like 10 years ago, people used to come to my office door and say, do you have a few minutes? And recently, I heard my 34-year-old son on the phone with his business partner saying, do you have 10 seconds? <laughs> and then I clocked him. They talked for 20 minutes. you know. But it's the expectation that we're going to do things in shorter and shorter time increments. So this is the dynamic of this time. How do we counteract it? We only counteract it through paying attention and making a decision to sit down when someone says, do you have 10 seconds? Yeah, you want to talk? I'll talk to you. But here's, a, here's a, I think, an important diagnostic. And I, I, I decided to present this tonight because I see so much friction and conflict within groups of activists, especially in the environmental movement. It seems to be the outstanding star for con internal conflict. And in some cases, among nonprofits and NGOs, because there's such competition for increasingly scarce resources, people are fighting more and going at each other more. Um, so I wanted to talk about this. Because you can see a lot about the quality of our relationships and whether they're be being made stronger or weaker by noticing how you or your organization or your class or your team or your family responds when something goes wrong. This is like a very precise diagnostic of how are we doing together. So here are a few alternatives. One is that we just deny there's a problem. You know, we just, no, that's not, we don't have to worry about that. That's not really of my, any concern. We just push it away. The second approach is we just find someone to blame. It may be ourselves. We're very good at that, unfortunately. But it's usually somebody else, you know, a colleague, a boss, a partner. So that's a very powerful dynamic. It's certainly all over the press, right? The minute something goes wrong, we're just blaming each other. But then the other question is, do we just line up and create factions and take sides? 
So if you've been in any work group, does this apply to most of you? You've been in a work setting. Be interesting for you to think about this. So when something went wrong, how did we behave? There is a positive alternative that I didn't put up, which is we sit down and we learn from it. We're not looking for blame. You know, the thing about blame, those of us who are in the new sciences and love to talk about nonlinearity, when it comes to blame, suddenly we believe that the world is, is best described by simple cause and effect. You did that, and it created this mess. Single, single person, single cause, and of course the world is not like that, and you know that, but we still revert to that. So think about in your experience when you've had those moments where the team has fallen apart because we got caught in the blame game, or we took sides, or we failed to learn from the experience, and we just denied that it was significant. And what that does to our relationships, I think, is pretty obvious, right? So one of the first rules for those of us who are trying to live in high risk, no clear path, but working on social change issues, is we must pay exquisite attention to our relationships. It's primary. It's primary. Because we make the road together. So I just thought I'd share with you right now what I would hope to appear on my gravestone, even though I don't plan to have a gravestone. But I don't need one after I've told everyone this. So it's this wonderful quote. We were together. I forget the rest. Nothing else is important except that we stay together. And one of the experiences I hope you've already had, but you may still be anticipating this, is that when humans are working well together, they experience joy, no matter the external circumstances. I've seen this in flood relief, disaster relief, very economically deprived South African and Zimbabwean villages, that when we really feel connected, that is joyful, no matter what's going on in our lives. And that's something we Westerners have a long road ahead to, to actually learn. This is not talking about feeling happy or cheerful. This is about just this like, pure uh, feeling of joy that also feels like pure sor sorrow sometimes, that's available when we are together, and it's not available if you feel disconnected, period. So, it's one of the blessings of interconnectedness. So that's the bit about relationships. And now I want to talk about the strong emotions of this time. Because this is, a, a, for me, being in many organizations over the course of a year, I'm just noticing that people now are speaking about these very strong emotions, grief, despair, rage, anger. And these are all justifiable, and they're very dangerous to our keeping, to persevering. So I'd like to ask you how you deal with your own anger. Now, I saw someone with a Galapagos shirt on. This is Galapagos blue-footed booby. They're actually very graceful seagulls. <laughs> I have other photos. But this one, I was about to step on him, and he just went Wah! And he's become famous. <laughs> How do you deal with anger? You don't have to answer. I just want you to think about this question. Because a lot of us are seemingly motivated by what I would call righteous anger. There is enough to feel righteous anger about. In fact, increasingly, there's more and more that we should feel angry about. But it's not an emotion that leads us to good, effective action. One of my teachers said that being angry is like 
eating rat poison and expecting it to still kill the rat. <laughs> because anger eats away at us. It's a source of great exhaustion in many people. They just can't take it any longer. So this is something for you to explore in a different setting. But I would really encourage you to notice whether you are motivated by anger, whether you think it's a source of temporary energy. I've been in conversations with people for whom that's true. And then I've been in a lot of conversations with people who I just don't know what to do with it. I feel it. I know it's not healthy for me to feel this angry. I know it's eating me up inside, but I don't know what to do with it. So this is something we need to work with. We need to work on. We need to work with. And I can't cover it here. But it's a very important thing to notice. What role is anger playing in you right now? Because the Dalai Lama gave us great advice that a positive future never emerges from the mind of anger and despair. That's just how it is. So this is work we need to focus on if, in fact, anger is a problem for us. There is so much aggression in the society right now that it's hard not to act with aggression in return. Of course, the ultimate form of aggression, the most subtle form of aggression, is feeling that you want to help somebody. <laughs> you want to act on them, on their behalf. That's a very subtle form of aggression. But the more dominant aggression, which is everywhere in the, you know, I, I recently love it when I'm on Microsoft. And a, and a page isn't loading on the internet, and it gives me a choice. Do you want to kill this page? And I go, yes, I'd love to kill this page. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh. And all of our language is so aggressive now, really so aggressive. You know, um, Anyway, I won't go into it. That's a rant of mine. I won't go into it. But I do want to say that I'm working now with this new identity in my uh, course, the short course, is about warriors for the human spirit. I use the word warrior in the Tibetan sense of pawo, which is one who is brave, but never uses aggression. <laughs> so it's a little turn there that's important to notice. And what are we brave about? Well, I think there are at least two things to be brave about. And one is that we're brave enough to have faith in other people, to believe that we can bring out good qualities in one another, that they're there. And the second one, which is, I think, harder, is to aspire. And I put it in this very tentative phrasing because this is hard work. We aspire to not use aggression and to not use fear to accomplish our purposes. And this stands us in opposition to the dominant techniques of this time, which is fear and aggression, outright coercion and aggression in an atmosphere of fear. So to take on the warrior's role is to decide, I'm going to try my best not to get caught in aggression, tit for tat, not to get caught in fear, and to manifest as best I can my faith in the human spirit. That's hard work. So another question for you is, how are you dealing with these very strong emotions? Sorrow, grief, despair, exhaustion? They're sort of connected. I'm often in a question with my colleagues, uh, which is, we know so much about what's going on in the world. We know so much now. Is the human heart really capable of holding all the suffering that we're well informed about? Really, that's, you know, how much can we take? And then we want to, we want to keep our hearts open, we want to be available, but it becomes overwhelming. So we each have strategies for um, 
sort of nourishing and protecting ourselves. Like, I don't watch the news anymore at all. Every so often, I'll turn the radio on, and I'll listen to like three minutes, and I'll go, why are you doing this to yourself, Meg? You know you're going to get outraged again. Um, other people you know, will talk more about personal practices for finding peace. But somehow, we have to both acknowledge we're in these very deep emotions. They're unavoidable if you're, if you're alert to what's going on. I work with national parks in the US. And um, the grief that is in some of the park leaders, the park superintendents, is they are deciding which species, because of climate change, which species to try and protect and which species to abandon. So they are, feel, I'm playing God. This is not what I signed up for. And how do I deal with this? How do I deal with this? That's one of the big questions. I don't have an answer for that. I have a personal practice, but I don't have a, you know, an answer for that. But I think it's very healthy for us to acknowledge that we're living in a time when these emotions come up and up and up. And we need to notice what they're doing to our mental health, our spiritual well-being, and our sense of just wanting to stay, to persevere. So I'm going to um, talk about three ways of nourishing ourselves, although the first one is in this photo of really being there for each other. I think you know this already. So I won't stress being there for each other, but we definitely need friends. We need friends we can go to, to rant, to cry, to just say, I'm so fed up, I can't go back another day. And then after you say that, you're OK, and you go back. You know, um, Giving voice to these strong feelings often is one way to mitigate them. But there are other ways. So the first is to actually find regular and frequent times to think. This feels bizarre every time I have to say it. But I have to say, in my observation in the worlds that I'm in, in many different countries, thinking has disappeared from the workplace. It's not valued. And it's you know time pressures, time compression. Make a decision now. And if you can't make a decision now, it just shows you're a bad leader. And we're doing so much more. So finding regular time to think is a way of actually reclaiming time, period. What happens when we're in a regular practice of just thinking, settling down? I'm not even talking about meditation yet. I will. But our experience of time shifts once we slow down. And this is guaranteed. This happens. Everyone notices this when it happens. So time is not this abstract ruler. We can control time by controlling our internal clocks or our internal being. So finding regular times to think not only changes your experience of time, but it actually gives you good ideas. <laughs> you know, it actually leads to finding solutions to your problems. It, it actually gives you a sense of capacity and like, yeah, I can deal with this. So try it if you're not doing it right now. Now, you're in these seminars and in this lovely region of Devon, so perhaps time to think has never eluded you. But I bet it has <laughs> for many of us. The second is a corollary to this, which is from time to time, we just have to tune in to the bigger picture. We just have to develop a sense of, of why everything is going on the way it's going on. So we stop being these little you know, compressed beings who are just responding moment by moment. Sitting back and developing spaciousness of view also develops wisdom, 
but it also develops relaxation. So that's very important. And thirdly is a personal question for you. What is your current practice for finding peace? Do you know what peace feels like? Besides walking down a country lane here, I mean, this is a setup for peace. <laughs> um, listening to bird call, it's just magnificent. But day to day, wherever you live in your lives, do you have a practice for finding, for experiencing peace? Yes? No? How, I, I'd love to see a show of hands here. How many of you have this? Excellent, excellent. And is the practice that you have right now sufficient? Because that's what I find. It's like it used to work 20 minutes in the morning meditating doesn't, doesn't do enough for me now. You know? And so I, I create other opportunities, shorter time periods and such. But if you have a practice, please assess whether it's working as well as it used to, as everything speeds up. If you don't have a practice, turn to the people who just raised their hand and ask them what they do. Okay, on your way back to the college, please, please check in about that. There is, I mean, I say this to leaders, I don't care where I am at this point or who they are, but I say if you don't have some sort of practice for gaining center, and, and I call that a spiritual practice because the other component of it is some kind of practice that places you within a grander universe rather than thinking you're the whole show. That, that really helps you identify your place in life. And I don't think anyone can survive in the modern work world or the activist world without some sort of dedicated, regular, trustworthy, practice of prayer or meditation or centering that also then connects you to life. Because I was just listening to a beautiful man. He's someone I've worked with in the past, and he was giving a speech. He created the Living Futures Institute, which those of you interested in eco-design or buildings that are alive, not just green in technical ways, but are truly alive, I, w I would encourage you to look up this website. And the, the founder, Jason McClellan, was giving a talk. And he was speaking about all their successes at creating living buildings in downtown Seattle and schools and nurseries and even cities that are now coming alive with living buildings. But he said, you know, that work is not the basis for what we do. The basis for what we do is that we love this planet, and we love life. Not my personal life, but the living world. And I was so moved to hear him say it so clearly, because if, if we, our deepest motivation is our sense of interconnectedness or interbeing, if that's our deepest motivation, and I hope it is yours, or it's yet for you to discover, but once you have that clarity, then you realize the work you're doing, however it manifests, whatever form it takes, is all because you have recognized that not only do you love life, but life loves you back. There's some sense of deep harmony here, of participation with the living universe. And once you have that experience, then it's much easier to keep going in the midst of the insanity of this time. So I, I have one more piece, and then I'm really curious about your questions or comments. And this is probably the most important part of what I want to say, is how do we discover, this is another booby, by the way, at the Galapagos. So you can see they're very beautiful. It's a different kind, but when we discover our right work, we move beyond the need to have hope. And we move into this place of being very dedicated, very free, very focused, 
because we are no longer encumbered by hope or fear. And this is, I'm just going to give you a, the, probably the most famous phrase throughout all of Buddhism is the place beyond hope and fear. Because hope and fear are the same thing. <laughs> we hope for a certain outcome. We expect that our work will bear fruit. We expect that we will save the world in one way or another. We put so much investment in that, all of our hope, all of our energy. And what we don't realize is that when we're basing our work on hope, what we've already brought in the room with it is fear, fear of failing, discouragement, despair even, when it doesn't work the way we want it to. So the place beyond hope and fear, in my own experience now, is a place of luminosity, of incredible clarity, that this is my work and I'm going to do it no matter what. Václav Havel said this the best. He said, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. I, I was listening to an American reporter, Chris Hedges. He's a brilliant commentator on the collapse going on in America right now. Um, and he said, you know, I'm not doing any of this because I think I'm going to win. He said, I don't fight fascism because I think I can win. I fight fascism because it's fascism. It's having that kind of uh, clarity to what's of real value, no matter what. No matter what. Someone else said that expectations are just premeditated disappointment. That's another way of talking about hope and fear. <laughs> In my own country, we have, we make hope, feeling hopeful, a project, <laughs> you know? And we feel that without hope, we won't be motivated. And what we don't realize, any of us, is that, I just, I just heard this from a neuroscientist. He was very puzzled by this finding. He said, the same area of the brain lights up with fear and pleasure. And it's like a switch that just keeps going back and forth, back and forth between fear and pleasure. And the Tibetan Lama in the room said, well, we understand that. That's hope and fear. They come together. They are the same emotion. We don't realize that. So how do we find the place of commitment and freedom to act and discovering that this is the work I'm going to do no matter what? That's the place of true power for me. This is my right work. And I choose it, or as we've been talking in my short course, we have the feeling it chose us. You know. And then there's no turning back. So then you're on this path without a goal. You're on this path that isn't a path, and you just keep going little by little because you have this clarity that this is the work I have to do. If I don't do it, it will probably kill me. I've done a lot of work in South Africa and, and watched you know, the loss of hope that was known as the nation of hope with Mandela. And now it's, it's really quite tragic and sad what's happened there in terms of classism, racism, violence, clanism. I, I'm, it's very disheartening. But when I've been with people who are still active in their communities, doing social good programs, I was with one woman, and, I, and we were talking, and I said, I was here in the good days. And she said, yes, yes, I remember those. And I said, well, why do you keep doing the work you're doing? It's clearly not creating the, the rainbow nation. It's clearly not changing the economic standing of blacks. It's clearly not serving youth, except in a moment by moment way. Why do you continue? And she just looked at me. She said, what else would I be doing? And that kind of certainty is the ultimate motivation. When you connect with your work as truly your work, 
then all of these negativities that are part of the path and part of the uncertainty of the path, they don't matter as much. It's like there's nothing else. There's no choice. It's called the choiceless choice in some circles. So I hope that you all find that at some point. It can take some time, but it's not based on I'm going to choose where I will be most effective. It's the work chooses us, and then there's a whole energy source available. One of the women that I've had the great pleasure of learning from, working with a little bit, is now almost 100 years old, Grace Lee Boggs. She lives in Detroit. And she almost died a few months ago, and she put out this letter, I'm coming to the end of a long journey. Began World War II. And this is what she said we've accomplished. A revolution that is based on the people exercising their creativity in the midst of devastation is one of the great historical contributions of humankind. I don't argue with her. <laughs> 99 years of activism. And this is the distillation of it. The work is worth doing because the work is worth doing. And that's the ultimate freedom. So I wanted to close with two things. The first is my own fascination with who we were way back in time. So. Here is a photo of a flute from 40,000 years ago. And this wonderful quote by a French anthropologist. I should like to think the prehistoric man's first invention, first condition of his survival, was a sense of humor. <laughs> it, it goes on to say, because otherwise it would have been a very dark existence, you know, if you couldn't laugh at it all. But this flute is so remarkable. It's a window into our unending human creativity it was discovered in caves where there are also these beautiful, mystical, un incomprehensible cave paintings from 35,000 years ago now. This flute was made from, I think this one is made from a swan's wing. But it was sectioned, it was cut down, down the center line, hollowed out, and then glued back together so it's airtight. And get this, it plays a pentatonic scale. <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah. You can play modern songs on this flute. The, the great five tones of the universe, perhaps. Other flutes were cut this way, vertically, and to make them straight and then glued back together. And you know, Darwin couldn't understand this. He didn't understand the role that music played. You find it in all human society, he couldn't understand it. It had no evolutionary importance to him. So he's just puzzled by it. I'm going, really? <laughs> Did you miss the fact that birds sing and crickets chirp and oceans roar and streams trickle and it's all sound? Did you miss that? <laughs> You know, how could we not answer? So, sense of humor, sense of beauty, sense of art, these are things that sustain the human spirit 40,000 years ago, probably longer, but this is the evidence we have. And I wanted to bring this up in closing to a modern, to our modern period, but also indigenous peoples of this prophecy that was issued by the Hopi elders in the year 2000. Now, the Hopi elders, their stewardship is for the planet, for Gaia. And this is an extremely painful time for them. And they have written letters to the United Nations. They have issued letters to be read by their elders. And um, they're trying still to get our attention. It's not working. But they issued this in 2000, which I find is a, a perfect expression of who we could choose to be for this time. 
Here is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid, who will try to hold on to the shore. They are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, and keep our heads above water. And I say, see who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and celebration, for we are the ones we have been waiting for. There's history to this last phrase, which is not unique to the Hopis. It came from the American poet June Jordan, writing about South African women in 1955, who before internet, phones, any way of organizing, <clears throat> massed on the capital of Pretoria, 40,000 strong, to oppose the most recent banning laws, the apartheid laws. And she wrote a really beautiful poem. And this was her final blessing or tribute to these 40,000 women. We are the ones we have been waiting for. So that's our role. <laughs> and. Um, I hope some of these sentiments and questions will continue to roll around in your hearts and heads so that you can be people who persevere and contribute and don't get destroyed by these very negative dynamics of this time. What I love about this quote, or this whole prophecy, is the description of two kinds of people, those who are clinging to the old ways who will be destroyed, they say, and those who are willing to push off into the unknown, into the uncertainty, into the flow, into the torrent, the rapids, which I think is the place we all belong. But uh, you'll have to decide that for yourself.